awards and recognition, acknowledging elected officials, Jackson County employees, and community members who model exemplary service and dedication. Sometimes volunteering can turn into a full-time job opportunity. That was the case for Les Pierce after volunteering at the Jackson County Expo Evacuation Center during the Almeida Fire. The Expo was so impressed with his work ethic, general knowledge, and overall incredible usefulness that they hired him as the lead grounds worker. And to this day, they don't regret it. Now we're honoring him as November's Employee of the Month. Les began at the Jackson County Expo when he was brought on as a temporary worker. His journey is a testament to his exceptional character and leadership qualities. In the face of a crisis during the Almeida Fire, Les stepped up in an extraordinary way. Upon arrival at the evacuation center, he selflessly offered to volunteer, asking, quote, where and what do you need me to do, end quote. Les's unwavering dedication and willingness to help others shone brightly during that challenging time. As the evacuation center evolved, so did everyone's confidence in Les. His compassionate and caring attitude, coupled with his proactive approach, became a source of inspiration. Les did not just com complete what was needed, he went above and beyond, finding people to assist and taking on any task required. Les's remarkable qualities did not go unnoticed. Recognizing his exceptional contributions and leadership potential, the county offered him a position at the expo where he was hired in February of 2022, and he was a lead, grounds, lead expo grounds worker. It quickly became evident that Les, is, Les was more than an employee. He's a natural leader. Since joining the expo, Les has elevated the level of service. He fearlessly tackles challenges, whether it is making simple yet impactful changes to a sound system or undertaking complex tasks like changing hydraulic lines in a tractor. <laughs> Les does not shy away from any challenge. Instead, he approaches every task with enthusiasm and determination. Les's presence has undeniably made the expo a better place. He continues, his continuous efforts, expertise, and commitment to improvement are shaping a brighter future for the organization every day. Jackson County is truly fortunate to have him as part of its team. Thus, on behalf of the Jackson County Board of Commissioners, congratulations on being selected as the November Employee of the Month, and thank you for your outstanding dedication to the citizens of Jackson County. Congratulations, Les. I heard you say somewhere there, less is more. I like that. I think your t-shirts that should be made that say that, yeah. that everybody should wear, should have worn here today. No, uh, we all know about the great work done at the expo uh, during the pandemic, the fires. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's just when the bright the spotlight was shining. I know that work is done every single day. And in a, in a recent meeting with the, uh, the Fair Board, a joint meeting, um, you know, we acknowledge that there's some setbacks uh, that have been experienced out at the Expo, but we also acknowledge that we know uh, that because of the leadership and because of up and down every employee out there, we are 100% confident that the Expo will get back to where they were and even beyond. And it's because of employees like you and everyone I see out here today. We appreciate all that you do. And here, here, I'll just, I'll just also add that having been out at the expo for three weeks straight during the, during the fires and everything, I can tell you, I, I know exactly what you were doing out there. And you did a wonderful job. And it was, that was pretty tough because that was a pickup ball game. That was, that was really hard. So thanks a lot for everything you're doing. Thank you. All right. Okay. I am uh, pretending to be JB. I have a message from JB Demick, who's our current, our board president. Uh, he says, Les has gone above and beyond during his time at the Expo. Les is a very well-rounded individual who knows a little something about everything. Folks around the fair have always commented on how calm, cool, and collected Les is during the fair. And this is no easy task when you have put in 60 plus hours before Wednesday of that week. But in true form, Les always has a smile on his face. Les really cares about the 4-H and FFA youth in this county coming out of COVID. Les used his audio and visual skills to live stream the junior livestock auctions, a practice that we, will, we still use today. Les, you are one of a kind and a true asset to Jackson County and the Expo. And I... So. <laughs>
means less is more. You get what I'm calling <laughs> Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> safe community ongoing developments in public safety law enforcement and community justice a major issue being faced in oregon is a significant shortage of public defenders for people in custody and jackson county is not immune this last summer, a class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of criminal defendants in Washington County who were waiting long periods of time before getting access to public defenders. And now Jackson County is facing a similar case. If you're not familiar, it's a case that started in Washington County. We'll go into kind of the history of it, which uh, created a ruling about how long people could stay in custody specifically without being assigned representation. So it all started with this bed chart versus Garrett, that's Sheriff Garrett out of Washington County. It was brought forth by one of the federal public defender's offices. And it really initially grouped together as one class, all of the people who were unrepresented and had been charged with the crimes. This is the number that they estimated here. 164 people were in custody statewide and just under 2,500 people who they estimated were out of custody statewide, but with release conditions. The original um, filing or the, the suit wanted anybody who had been charged with any crime who didn't have representation with, within 48 hours of arraignment to have the charges dismissed. So that was a pretty extreme approach by the uh, public defender's office. And so when we get to where we are now, you can kind of see where it started as this really extreme thing and kind of landed somewhere where, I mean, if you really look at it, people probably should be afforded representation of their charge with crimes, especially people who are in custody. This is his initial decision about the temporary restraining order. What he said was, it's clear that we have here things that would win in any challenge to the civil rights violation pieces. And in doing that, we need to make a decision about those people who are specifically in custody, about how they either get representation in a timely manner or they're not held in custody any further. It basically said that after the first appearance by an in-custody defendant who was found to be indigent and had all the qualifying circumstances for a public defender, that if they were not assigned a public defender or representation of some kind within 10 days, then they had to be released from custody. And that in that release, they had these conditions that had to be set forth. And, you know, if they violated those, they could be arrested, like we said before. Um, but it was... You know, it was pretty clear in Washington County that this was going to be the standard. And that temporary restraining order was set to go into place on August 27th. At the time, the judges here in Jackson County decided that we were going to be able to make some progress in at least getting the most severe of the crimes who were in custody assigned a defense attorney. And so we were not going to release people just under the 10 day conditions. Again, that same federal public defender filed a suit in Jackson County against us. I had the benefit of being named in a lawsuit over something that I don't necessarily have any control of how things go, which is interesting. I thought, man, that's just really odd. They're going to sue me. But then you look at the system and, of course, the jail is kind of the linchpin, right? We run the jail. If somebody's in jail and people believe that their their rights are being violated, you sue the person that can push the the green button to let them out, not necessarily who's responsible for the dysfunction of the public defender's office or whatever else is going on in the court. So at the end of the day, a new order came out and was set to go into effect on November 23rd. And it went from 10 days to seven days was the change for people who were in custody. This overrode the temporary restraining orders. This became the permanent order and opinion. And the biggest change from the temporary restraining order process and the order and opinion is that they included all of the state of Oregon. And it seems like to me, you know, when I read the opinion and you read the other information and, and you know, I hate to b cast blame, but it really feels like part of the judicial system fell asleep at the wheel up there in Washington County. Judges were aware that people didn't have attorneys. Other people involved were aware they didn't have attorneys, but yet nobody was doing anything to correct or remedy the problem. And therefore, the judge came in and remedied it for us in a way that maybe not as uh, potentially 
it could it could be harmful to the community if it goes in effect in its current order. On November 21st, that was the number of people who would have been in our jail and released with the seven days or more. Our hope always within the jail is to, to not have to make the decision to release people who have at least been alleged to commit violent crimes in our community already. And so we're hoping that we can continue to work together with the courts and, and make sure that the right people are prioritized in that. The plan is, if moving forward prior to this, uh, prior to this state till February, which I'm, there will be some, there will obviously be some ruling in February that will affect all of us and how that proceeds forward. Um, plan was basically to kind of evaluate this on a week to week basis so we could take in the most serious cases as they come along. The advantage we have in this this county is that we have a good relationship, and so when we identify cases, if they're, you know, see felonies where we think there needs to be an attorney on that case to prevent somebody from getting released. I know we can have those conversations and hopefully prioritize that case to be taken before we run into uh, the, the timeline. So that, you know, we have, we've had a lack of jail space in this county for quite some time, which means if you're, if you stay lodged in the Jackson County Jail longer than a week, you're probably in on a pretty serious charge or your criminal history is so bad um, that we wanna keep you in. For the past several months, Jackson County Community Justice has been working hard to get grant money from the Justice Reinvestment Plan to fund programs that reduce recidivism through evidence-based practices that uphold public safety and accountability. At this month's meeting, Community Justice Director Kiki Parker-Rose gave an update on the status of the funding and what they're doing to secure as much as possible. The Grant Review Committee, who takes a look at our applications for that funding, um, made a recommendation to only fund us provisionally for one year instead of funding us for two years biennially and they um, gave a couple of reasons for that. We went ahead and put together a response and sent that to the Criminal Justice Commission commissioners who are going to be meeting. I intend to uh, provide some testimony ahead of time just in support of them fully funding us for the full biennium. So just as a reminder, the goals of the JRP are to reduce recidivism through evidence-based practices while protecting the public safety and holding individuals accountable and decreasing prison utilization for property, drug, and driving offenses while protecting public safety and holding those individuals accountable. We requested $1,387,818.20. That's because this is a formula grant and we get a certain percentage of the overall Justice Reinvestment Program funds. So that's an automatic amount given to us based on our population here. We requested to continue funding for the Pathfinder Network, our Voices of Lived Experience, Nathan Beard Job Development, our Transitional Care Program, which is our TC program, our residential program out at the Transition Center, and our Resource Center. And because we no longer are doing pretrial, that's what we had historically uh, paid or used the Justice Reinvestment Program dollars for, was for the, for the pretrial program. That was moved to the court, and we'll, the court will fully take that over on December 31st. We then requested creating a new program to try to fill some of the gap of people coming into the jail and getting out quickly without any resources. They're unhoused. They come in and go quickly. And so our plan was if we could place somebody there to help case manage those folks out, that we could try to reduce the number of people returning to custody as they went through the justice process. Listening to the grant review committee go over our application, they decided to only recommend this provisional funding. This is the notice that we received. A lot of the reason that they only recommended provisional funding is because we did mention ballot measure 110 in our application process as something that is contributing to the number of drug driving and property crimes in our community. When we mentioned that, we didn't have the data submitted to them to support that. They also were looking, of course, at our 25% increase in prison usage since uh, inception of the um, Justice Reinvestment Program. After we reviewed all of our data, we were able to show that um, Justice Reinvestment Funding, just over the last five years, we took our last five years of data, um, has assisted over 12,000 clients and services and helped provide over 11,000 clients and services to victims within our community. We saw property crime arrests decline in 2018 through 2020. 
In 2021, property crime arrests began to increase in Jackson County while drug and driving cases decreased. That makes sense. Ballot measure 110 decriminalized drugs. It's natural that we would see that reduction, but we did continue to see this increase in property crimes. During that same period, our supervised population has increased by 0.9%. The data collective shows that we diverted in the last five years 604 people, 863 cases from prison during that five year time period. During that time period, 129 people representing 198 cases that were previously diverted from prison were revoked. So we tried to make it equitable. Yes, we diverted them up front, but those that came to us on supervision and we ended up revoking wanted to make it realistic data because that's not a prison bed day savings. What we found was 13,729 months worth of savings can be attributed to Jackson County in diverting that number of people and cases into our community. The courts are putting them on probation as opposed to sending them to the institution. In an effort to reduce the usage, specifically length of stay, because they also said that our length of stay was higher than the rest of the counties, we brought back from prison early 199 folks. That also contributes to a reduction of months in jail. So that's 556 months. So based on my math, in 2021, 2023, the Department of Corrections released a fact sheet report where they said that it costs an average of $140.87 per day to house somebody in, a, in an institution. It was $12.43 to keep them supervised in the community. If we had diverted 14,285 months, which equals 44,835 days, Keeping in mind, first sentence probation revocations and short-term trans leave, it feels like that's about 62,382,166.45 savings. Now I know that that's not really the way they do their math because I looked at the cost avoidance chart and they have a bunch of other things in there. But if you just look at dollar for dollar, day for day, Jackson County is doing what we need to be doing on justice reinvestment. We are diverting the right people, we are providing supervision to the right population, and we're revoking them when they're not successful under supervision. So this is sort of the argument that I'm going to attempt to make in my three minutes of public testimony that I get before the Criminal Justice Commission. Awards and recognition. Acknowledging elected officials, Jackson County employees, and community members who model exemplary service and dedication. Every year, the presiding chair of the Board of Commissioners selects a recipient for the annual Chairman's Award, which recognizes a local resident whose lifetime achievements have gone above and beyond in making a profound difference in people's lives. This year, Board Chair Colleen Roberts chose Darcy Mann Self, whose decades of community service, numerous recognitions from local organizations, and positive impact on many people's lives have made her stand out as a true servant leader in Jackson County. So Darcy was raised on a 750-acre alfalfa ranch in Malin, Oregon. She attended Lost River High School and then continued her education by attending Southern Oregon State University, or Southern Oregon State College, which has been many names, but now SOU, right? <laughs> Where she received her Bachelor of Science degree in business management. Darcy's career began with her family's business, a country corner located in Milan. Then she went on to work for U.S. Bank in Medford as a loan officer for Bob Frank Nissan from 1987 to 1989, and for John Hamblin Motors from 1989 to 1991 as an office manager. In 1990, Darcy began her career as a comptroller with Insurance Marketplace, which is now High Street Insurance, where she's been employed for over 32 years. Time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> Darcy has been a leader in the community with her decades of community service. In 1989, she was only the second woman in the state to be installed as a member of the Lions Club. Over the years, she has earned numerous awards, 
To name a few, she has the Seroptimus Award for Women Who Make a Difference, the Seroptimus Award for Advancing the Status of Women, the Community Spirit Award presented by the Chem Chamber of Medford in Jackson County, the Community Loyalty Hero Award presented by Rogue Credit Union, the Guardian Angel Award presented by Hearts with a Mission Youth Shelter, and won third place in Dancing with the Rogue Valley Stars benefiting the Sparrows Club. <laughs> Today, Darcy continues her, to display her passion for the community by devoting her time to the Seroptimus International Rogue Valley Club, the Rustic Relics Antique Tractor Club, Hearts with a Mission Youth Shelter, and Central Point Presbyterian Church. And of course, the Pear Blossom Festival, which I think you're most notably known, I mean, to the most of us, uh, which you have been a passionate and influential board member for 37 years and the president for 30 years. <laughs> During her time as the president of the Pear Blossom Festival, Darcy's been involved in the creation of many activities that support the event and, and the parade, including but not limited to the Queen's Scholarship Pageant and the annual uh, Pedal for a Cause bike ride, Pedals and Pears. And isn't there a junior court like for five-year-olds? I, I had a son compete in that once, and that's a whole nother story. <laughs> that's quite entertaining. <laughs> Over the decades, with Darcy's exceptional leadership, the Pear Blossom Festival has received multiple recognitions, including the 2014 Mayor's Award the 2000, and the 2016 and 17 Southern Oregon Best of the Best Award, and in 2016 received an Oregon Heritage Tradition designation for being in continuous operation for more than 50 years, demonstrating a public profile and reputation that distinguishes it from more routine events and adding to the livability and identity of Jackson County and the state as a whole. And you ask, in her spare time, what does Darcy do? Well, in her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her husband, Steve, who's joined us today too. He's here somewhere. There he is. <laughs> and there are three Rottweilers working on the family ranch, playing piano, scrapbooking, needlepoint, and is involved with various family and social events. Service to the community is a way of life for Darcy Manself. And as a chair of the Board of County Commissioners, I'm honored to recognize her with the 2023 Chairman's Award for outstanding work in the field of community service. Well, when I heard that list of, uh, of awards that you won, it seems like this was the last one to be, to <laughs> so we, so we, fi we finally got to it. We finally completed the list. No, I, I really like, um, we, we have a lot of recognition and, and awards that we give throughout the year, but this is always my favorite because we get to hear about the true superstars in our community and we really get to hear about what they do in depth and I mean, I'm sure we could have gone pages more, but that's extremely impressive. I think uh, Commissioner Roberts, you hit this one out of the park. Um, well, you did it. She just, <laughs> she just, she just saw you hit it out of the park. But either way, uh, we appreciate what you. You're an inspiration. Uh, you're an absolute huge asset to our community, and just congratulations and thank you for what you do. And before I forget, my sister would be very upset. Uh, my sister Cheryl Dyer. And she wanted to be here. Uh, she, again, says the same things. You are just a dynamo. You are an inspiration. But the one thing that trumped her being here is she's got a brand new uh, grandbaby oh. in, in Reno. So I think we can all can understand that. <laughs> but she wanted to, to say congratulations as well. So congratulations and thank you. I'll simply say that, you know, it's impossible to add to that and, and everything. But I will just say that, you know, what's really remarkable about our community is we have so many people like you but you stand out so much and we just wouldn't be the community we'd be without without you you know that really really means a lot to us it really is great so congratulations thank you and this is kind of a special award and sometimes you have lots of guests that come and i would like to open it if anybody would like to say anything you get the final word <laughs> but if anybody wants to say anything about their how Darcy's affected their lives or I know I always think when I read her list of accomplishments I go 
well, when I, when I get old, I want to be Darcy, but I am old. <laughs> so never mind. It's too late. <laughs> but anyway, if anybody would like to say anything, you're sure welcome to, but you have to come up and use a microphone. Darcy and I go back a long ways. I've been her hairdresser for 40 years plus. And I know a lot of secrets. And most, and most, well, you can talk for most, 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 most of the most amazing things <laughs> have been the moments she shared with me, um, very humbly, about the amazing things that she's done in her life. And as a hairdresser, you just listen. And um, I just so loved every moment. And I've, I can I don't have a friend that I'm more proud of, <laughs> besides maybe you. <laughs> We're both Clam Falls girls, and we've known each other a long time, all of us. But Darcy and I go back. And she has a wall in her, in her hallway that indicates all the funny hairdresser styles I've done on her. <laughs> but anyway, I couldn't be more proud, and, and we all are. I'm so happy to share this moment with you, because I love you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. you deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? We get a moment with the woman of the hour here. I'm Kevin Lampson, and I'm the founder of Hearts with a Mission. And Darcy has been just a huge, huge support, not just of the organization, but of the kids. Uh, she became our board chair a few years back. She organizes every one of our events. In fact, a few years ago, Darcy said, do you want me to take on your annual event? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, there's one condition. And I said, well, what's that? And she says, you no longer have a say in anything. <laughs> so once we got that established, I thought, well, great. And I actually was in Chicago one year and didn't get home till 5.30 or 5. The event started at 6. And when I showed up, everything was perfect and i thought i never have to doubt her again she's totally capable but we would not be the organization we are without you so i want to just commend you i love you and thank you thank you for that well i will just say uh, the plaque that it gets awarded to Darcy, said the Chairman's Award, presented to Darcy Manself for the lifetime achievement as a citizen of Jackson County in the field of community service. Darcy Manself is hereby acknowledged as Jackson County's esteemed Citizen of the Year for 2023. And you do, as promised, you get to say the final word. I'll be quick. My high school speech teacher told me once that the best speech had three things. It's impactful, it's engaging, and it's short. And I told her, two out of three isn't bad. <laughs> but this is an incredible honor today, and I thank you so much for including me on what I know from the past is an incredible list of recipients. So I'm very honored and very humbled to receive this. I think that everyone here today that knows me knows that I would rather be planning the after party. <laughs> I don't do the work or carry on a 71-year tradition for me, but rather the community and for the betterment of the community and to make others happy and to bring something to the town. Having a heart to give and volunteer and to be kind and think of others first begins when you're very young with your family as your center. As you grow and move on, you have mentors and friends that serve as examples of what caring and giving is all about. I was fortunate when I moved here almost 40 years ago that I had many people that stepped in to lead and guide me. Over 30 years ago, one of my previous bosses, Bob Frank, who had car dealerships up and down the West Coast, taught me three things that I believe in and follow today. Surround yourself with good people, have the right people in the right place doing the right thing, and get your money in the bank. And my husband says, I always get the money in the bank, I just have a hard time keeping it there. <laughs> and I told him, two out of three isn't bad. <laughs> As I think of all the friends and fellow vol volunteers and club members that I have surrounded myself with, many who are here today, these are these good people and the right people, and they're my inspirations to volunteer and to help others and to continue traditions. They're my cheerleaders, and they push me to be active and involved, so I wouldn't be receiving this today if it hadn't started in a good home with all of these good people. So I share this with them for inspiring me, pushing me, and supporting me, and my husband for putting up with my crazy. <laughs> So thank you for this chairman's choice, for adding me to a list of amazing people that have done so much for our county. I'm truly honored and humbled to be receiving this. 
And since my mom taught me to never go anywhere without taking something to give, I had chocolate bars made by my friend, Dina Branson, and they say, stop me before I volunteer again. <laughs> so for each one of you, I have chocolates. Thank you. Congratulations, and thank you for, for being our Chairman's Award. Well deserved. Thank you for joining us for this close-up look at the stories that matter most to you. We hope you feel a little more connected to the people and places that make Jackson County such a special place to live.